So, yes, uh, welcome back. I see that uh, uh, the audience is, uh, there are a lot of people getting into the audience for this uh, start of the second session of uh, the final day for uh, for the uh, for the uh, this uh, GRSS school on advanced methods for uh, remote sensing information extraction. So the, the second session of uh, the final day starts with a panel debate on uh, artificial intelligence and remote sensing needs and goals, and uh, we have the privilege and the pleasure of having with us an outstanding, uh, an, an outstanding panel uh, uh, that will discuss about uh, all these topics. We have uh, Klaus Petersen, that is uh, CEO of NORA, the Norwegian Artificial Intelligence uh, Research Consortium that is also uh, sponsoring this, uh, this panel debate. So welcome Klaus. Then we have uh, Paolo Gamba from the University of Pavia in Italy. Uh, that is uh, also the IEEE GRSS president. Uh, welcome, Paolo. We yeah. have uh, uh, Maria Piles. We, uh, we have uh, uh, attended uh, her fantastic presentation this morning. So uh, Maria is from the University of Valencia in Spain and also the chair of the IEEE GRSS uh, Spain chapter. Welcome back, Maria. Thank you. And uh, finally, we have Ronnie Jansch uh, from uh, DLR in Germany. Uh, welcome, Ronnie. And uh, he is also a co chair of the IEEE GRSS Technical Committee on uh, Image Analysis and Data Fusion. And uh, so, yes, welcome, Ronnie. It's very, it's very nice to have you here with us. Thank you very much. And um, so, without uh, further ado, I just uh, stop sharing my, my screen and I leave the floor to you guys. And uh, we will always stick around. And, uh, uh, as for the for the audience, uh, I just uh, I just mentioned that uh, you can um, you can post your questions in the Q and A box, and then uh, this could be uh, a matter for discussion in uh, in uh, in the panel debate. Okay. In any case, I I leave the floor to you guys, and please, here we go. Thank you very much, Andrea. So. Um... I, my name is Klaus Petersen, as uh, Andrea said, and I will try to moderate uh, the panel debate here. Um, just a short warning that my groan is not really in remote sensing. Uh, I'm a physicist of background. Uh, I have been doing um, computational neuroscience, and I have uh, also a background then in AI, and I am now a CEO of, of Nora, which is um, which is a quite big collaboration in Norway. In Norway, we have organized so that seven universities and two research institutes collaborate within AI, uh, AI and robotics. Uh, so, so that's kind of uh, my background. And also when it comes to computational neuroscience, I've been working in medicine, which is also very data intensive. And you also have this data explosion in, 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 uh, in medicine and, and neuroscience. Uh, so, of course, uh, then you need tools to handle all this uh, data uh, and artificial intelligence or machine learning and uh, uh, one of those tools. Uh, so, so that's kind of my background and I was thinking that the context for this panel debate is uh, a bit defocusing. Um, Andrea introduced the first day uh, when he introduced uh, this uh, this uh, conference, he said that uh, he had a lot of fast your seat belt speakers, uh, very great speakers. Uh, things were supposed to go fast, I think. Then uh, I think today we should try to lose off this seat belt, uh, take it a bit more slowly, and try to defocus uh, a bit. Uh, and as Andrea said, we want to also challenge the audience here to uh, so please use the Q and A button and post your questions to the to the panel. Uh, the limits here are about one hour, but Andrea said they are quite flexible in that sense. But we will try to stick to that, so we will at least uh, stop before three. Uh, Andrea introduced you shortly, all of you, but I think if we could have a 
uh, if you self could introduce you a bit more that so we know the bit wider uh, context if you could start uh, introducing yourself maria with your and say a little bit more about your uh, background okay thanks so uh, i'm maria pines from university of valencia i my background is on next observation and particularly uh, i've been working closely on microwave space missions and um, in, in my lab at the University of Valencia, the, uh, we've been working on machine learning approaches for remote sensing for, for many years. I was very lucky to join the group three years ago, and I'm, I'm learning a lot of the potential of different approaches for Earth observation. So I, I moved from a physical, purely physical approach to a more machine learning since I joined this group. And uh, I feel myself privileged to be in there. And, uh, and yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of potential for the for the application of AI in remote sensing and in all in all different aspects of of our lives as it is already in many in many fields. I think we can we can also leverage from it in remote sensing. Yeah. And you are also the chair of the IEEE GRSS Spain chapter. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I co-organize I co-organize the the school with, with Andrea. It was my pleasure to join. And to go to in this adventure, hmm. and, uh, and yeah, that's it. I've been a member of Fighter Police since I was a student, and uh, yeah, I've been serving as president since 2015. That's great, thank you. And uh, Paulo Gamba, please introduce yourself as well. Okay, so I'm Paolo Gamba. I'm from the University of Pavia in Italy and currently I'm the president of the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society and until the end of the year. Uh, my background uh, is, is basically, I am a microwave engineer, engineer. I started as a PhD in electromagnetics. Then I went working for a telecommunication company, came back to the university and started working on SAR applications or radar application of remote sensing. And then eventually my work has moved to uh, the use of any kind of sensor for uh, for extracting information about urban area. So urban remote sensing is my topic of, uh, of choice. And by doing that, we are working on many different data set of many different sensor, many different analysis, many different way of working together. And as a result, we are, have been also working partially on AI. And on the other side, being of course, uh, involved in the Geoscience Remote Sensing Society since uh, quite a number of years, uh, I have been in touch with many colleagues uh, that are working in the area and, um, and therefore I, I have some sort of experience and I guess that Andrea asked me to be in this panel because of the fact that I some sort of eye bird um, and possibility to highlight different uh, ideas at different uh, levels because of my uh, knowledge, not directly because I'm working on that area, but because I'm in touch with many colleagues all over the world. Thank you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, Andrea told me that, that you really have the big picture of the field. So maybe we can come back to that, I guess. But uh, so we will uh, introduce uh, Ronnie first. Uh, so Ronnie Hans, please. Yeah, thanks. So uh, as Klaas and Andrea already said, um, I'm Ronnie. Uh, I actually come from a computer vision machine learning background. So those were my, my studies at the Technical University in, in Berlin in Germany. And the first time I touched remote sensing was during my PhD, where I suddenly had to deal with synthetic aperture radar images. And from there on, I kind of stick with it. So I still do that uh, until today. Um, I stayed at the Tier Berlin for my postdoc a little bit. And then last year, I changed to the um, German Aerospace Center in, in, well, close to Munich in Oberfaffenhofen, a really funny German name. Um, so here I still. Uh, do uh, work on, on pulsar images. Uh, we are building our FSAR sensor, which is an airborne cell system. And the goal is to use machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and the corresponding tools in order to produce, you know, like higher level products based on, on the SAR data we have. And well, apart from deep learning techniques, my favorite techniques are ensemble methods, so like random forest, for example. So I put a lot of effort pushing this forward. And I'm always looking for applications where I can throw those methods into the fire and, and see what, what survives. So I'm 
more on the methods part and not so much from the application part, but I'm, I really have a lot of fun you know, applying those methods and see what, what happens. Great, thank you. Could, could you please give one example of a method or one project that you're working uh, on? Well, the most current project um, is probably called uh, the one which is called Deep SAR, so uh, a combination of deep learning and SAR. And here the, the goal is to combine physical models mm -hmm. we, we might have about how the sen sensing with a radar sensor works with the environment together with deep learning, uh, in particular in the applications of uh, forest hate and biomass mapping and also pen penetration bias over, over ice. So for, for those two applications, we have very nice physical models. They're modeling, you know, how, how the sensing works, uh, how the microwave is um, um, well, reacting on the ground and then measured by the sensor. And now the goal is to, to combine that with deep learning in order to boost performance. Exactly. So, so what do you think uh, deep learning would add to that uh, project then? Well, one thing is that um, so if you want to have realistic models, physical models, they, they soon get quite complicated. So, you know, you start with a very nice and simple mathematical equation, but then in order to make it really generalizable, uh, you, you kind of, you know, start adding parameters in order to go for search, uh, certain boundary conditions or uh, with special cases and so on. And then it's getting really hard to, to set those parameters correctly so that the model is still performing well over a larger area. And I think this is something where deep learning can help. So on the one hand, the physical model is constraining the solution space of the deep learning method to, to something that is physically reasonable. And on the other hand, the deep learning model can learn how those input parameters should be set in a data dependent way. And then hopefully you can achieve a, a higher generalization capability with, with those hybrid models than with either of the two models alone. That would be the idea. Do you have any comments to that, Maria? You showed uh, in your great lecture or presentation earlier today, you, you showed uh, several methods actually, but uh, many of them physics-based uh, with relatively simple equations. Uh, how do you think, you also showed uh, more general AI methods and PCA and statistical methods and so on, but how do you think um, uh, machine learning or AI or even deep learning can, can add to, to your field? So particularly for, for health sciences, um, I think the, the, the methods that are already uh, being used, they are very good at fitting, but it is hard to interpret them or to learn from the solutions. And I think that that's a challenge that we need to, to address because we want the models to, um, to help us into understanding the different earth system processes. And then we also want them to be able to extrapolate, for instance, that's another issue that you, you train the model with the observation that, that you have for a given region, but you want it to work in other situations. And uh, I think then there's the hybrid of, you know, you can use models and um, the physical models that can, can be useful and also to, to impose constraints into the, um, into the neural network, for instance, just add a last, a last layer that imposes uh, the solution to be uh, physically uh, that that accomplishes with the rules. So that mm. that's what Ronnie uh, was mm. was saying, I guess. So this uh, along those lines, we are focusing on climate. So on climate, what we want to do is to improve the uncertainties of the predictions, and and for that, you really need to control the process and you know translate some of the modules into. Uh, into machine learning, so you can use all the information, but also try to understand, you know, causal relations, interpret what's going on in there in the black boxes. So make them a little bit more gray. Yep, absolutely. You, you touched upon two really important aspects: uh, so interpretation, as you said, and and uh, also extrapolation outside mm -hmm. outside the typical training data set, then, which is a problem for for deep learning. So, so I think we will uh, go back to to those questions. Uh, but I want to then defocus uh, a bit. Also, now we have heard a couple of good examples on. Uh, projects and, uh, and usability of, of deep learning. But if we defocus on the whole field, uh, 
Paolo, if you maybe could give us a little bit of overview, especially maybe of the role of GRSS in, in the whole field of, of remote uh, sensing and, and the broader overview uh, of maybe organizations uh, and also needs and what, what you see for the future, uh, uh, future GRSS to be really. I think you need to unmute. Yeah, yeah, I'm muted. So, yeah. just, mm -hmm. I'm back. Uh, so there are a number of um, activities which are going on at the Geoscience Remote Sensing Society, which are uh, somehow trying to understand what is the future. On the one, on the one side, uh, I mean, we have a instrumentation and future technology te uh, technical committee, which is basically related to new sensors and new things. On the other side, Ronnie is in charge of the technical committee of the image analysis and data fusion. And uh, the nice thing which has been uh, uh, performed in the past year is that we have uh, a, a, a data fusion contest, which is uh, done every year. And it provides data set to the whole uh, community with a specific uh, type of um, scientific question that you want uh, to be addressed. So we provide for free Earth observation data and uh, some additional information. And we are uh, urging people to use whichever they want to achieve a specific uh, target or tell us which are the possible application of those data. And what I can tell you, and I think it's uh, something which is well known, is basically that the, the, the range of uh, researches, results, and other things which are basically, which are based on machine learning and deep learning uh, methodology is increasing. To the fact that my personal opinion is that uh, deep learning is, uh, uh, in Earth observation, a killer application in the sense that it killed everything else. Basically, it's not, uh, I mean, so if you look at the, many of the papers, uh, they are on deep learning. If you look at many of the work, uh, they are on deep learning. If you think about uh, using uh, uh, data and you ask people to do, uh, to try to find, you know, the best classification accuracy, they try to do it with deep learning. Now, what is uh, really interesting is that artificial intelligence, as we know, is not only deep learning. And in reality, what we would like to uh, be able is to uh, push the way this uh, uh, artificial intelligence is used in uh, both data interpretation and uh, the way the data is stored, the way the data is obtained or pre-processed. So as you know, one of the point that uh, Earth observation is uh, uh, the problem of Earth observation is the data is huge. A single image uh, is terabytes, okay? But it is terabyte uh, because we uh, basically record everything and then uh, we analyze everything afterwards because we don't know exactly what we are looking for. But for some specific application, we do know what we are looking for. And therefore, pre-processing could be something that save bandwidth, uh, storage, and things like that. And this is where I think that artificial intelligence is going to really have an important role. Like pre-screening of medical images, let's say. This is something that, of course, you know much better than me. In that case, pre-screening of the data, pre-screen, uh, I mean, or let's say rough interpretation ideas that, you know, that are given to the final um, more focused analysis, it is something which can help a lot. And I think this is where uh, we are, I mean, I think uh, this is where we are heading. This is where we, the, a society which has on the one side, people working on hardware and people working on software can uh, basically try to use the two advantages, sorry, the two groups and merge these two communities in order to push forward the boundary of what we can do right now. Uh, yeah, and uh, very interesting. And when you talk about pre-processing, you're talking about uh, what you call 
edge computing, I mean, uh, processing out at the satellites. Uh, that's what you... Yes, I'm talking about that. I mean, right now, basically what happened is that the, uh, I mean, the, the original, I mean, Earth observation started, uh, let's say, a few decades ago. It's a young uh, activity. We didn't have so many satellites. Uh, when I made my PhD, I had a few images, and those few images stayed on my computer. Now my PhD students are working on repositories, which are on the cloud. And they use cloud computing resources in order to work on them. They, they might do something which is on their own computer, but it's just a part of it. I mean, most of the, that, uh, the, the, the analysis is done on, on the cloud. And the idea is, is part of this analysis can be done on the satellite or at the ground station or when you retrieve the information from the database before you actually work on it. I think this is some sort of very good uh, way of exploiting the artificial intelligence. Actually, uh, it's a nice um, analogy to medicine when you do brain recordings. Um, the modern brain recordings technique, for example, um, uh, when you record um, extracellular potential, electrical potentials from the brain, some of these recorders just transmit what is important information. And in the brain, the important information are when the neurons fire spikes. So they, that's kind of the way they send the information. So I guess uh, the, this, what you're talking about when you're talking about pre-processing is the same, right? That you transmit only uh, the valuable information from the satellites. Yes. Yeah, and, and uh, if you pick up on that, uh, that would uh, save bandwidth and it would also, uh, are there other advantages? It, of course, you would not need to store that much data. Uh, I mean, it, it really, I mean, some of the data that we obtain from the satellite uh, are basically due to the fact that, uh, uh, let's say, we provide information back to the ground and then it is processed, uh, corrected by problems related to the atmosphere, which is, of course, between the satellite and, and the ground. And then it is analyzed in order to extract parameters. Now, this, the, the, this is something that uh, can be partially done if we had computing power, if you have a possibility, if you have something which is already there on the satellite. In, because in any case, we want something which is already, let's say, recovering the problem of the transmission from the satellite to the, and the Earth and from the Earth to the satellite. So this kind of uh, things is known. And of course, it is difficult to have all the information there. But since we are now having, a, let's say, a many satellites all around the world, some of them are uh, getting some information, some of them are getting other information. This information can be extracted, uh, transmitted among the satellite from the station to the satellite and so on. So in the future, what you can think is that part of this pre-processing is done directly and maybe is done better from the satellite than mm -hmm. from the ground. And on the other side, if you have specific satellites which are going to measure one specific variables, I mean, you have let's say satellites which are general, they take pictures of the surface. Then everybody use this picture for a specific application. People working on vegetation to extract the parameters about the vegetation. People working on urban areas like me, extract the information about the buildings, the change detection and so on. These are general Earth observation data. But if you look at other satellites, they are there in order to extract, let's say, the CO2 component on the uh, in the atmosphere or the precipitation amount of water in the, the which is in a specific uh, cell in the atmosphere so what they do is basically they record some sort of physical information and then this physical information physical information is provided down and it's elaborated by mean of means of one of these physical uh, uh, let's say uh, models in order to extract uh, the quantity of water, for instance, in a specific cell in the atmosphere. Okay, so this thing is something that uh, could be done. See if you could apply the model on the satellite instead of using the model on the ground, you could do it already. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Maria, in your talk, you were also touching upon the, this data explosion. 
Uh, I don't know if you have any comments. Uh, do you agree that more, more could be done out at, at the edge, at the very edge the, at the satellites? So when I, I was, um, I agree with, uh, with Paolo that the, we can do some pre-screening and uh, alleviate the data and everything. And I, I wanted to provide an example. It's a recent satellite um, mini uh, data cube, well, no, no, CubeSat. CubeSat satellite that was launched with the FSS CAT in which they, they tried this proof of concept of using machine learning on board just to process the optical data and only send the data that was not affected by clouds. Because in optical data, when we get the images, what well, the first thing we do is to apply a um, cloud screening algorithm, and then we keep the data that we are interested in. So it was done on board. So I think this is a, uh, an interesting example of, of things that, that can, can, be, can be done already at a, our homework at the satellite, yeah, for instance. And, uh, and uh, Ronia, uh, if you also have uh, comments, do you have a, or do, do you, if you could maybe tune also more into typical uh, examples, so you give us one example of what you use AI or deep learning to, uh, but, but do, you, do you think, do you find it also the same problem that the data explosion and the transmission of unnecessary data, is that the major, major challenge in the field? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, at the DLR and, and other and other groups, uh, not not ours, since we are mainly dealing with, with the airborne system there, it's not so much a problem. But the other groups are dealing with satellite systems, and, and there, of course, the downlink is always uh, a problem. And there are a couple of groups working on strategies how to to either compress the data or to limit the data that is uh, transferred. But AI processing on board on, uh, of satellites have has another advantage. Um, so usually satellites can switch between different modi, um, and usually those those modi they make a, a trade-off between, on the one hand, the, the resolution you get either in the spectral or in the spatial domain, and the the size of the picture. So how much of the ground you can cover with one with one picture. Let's let's put it this way. And uh, one smart idea is to use AI to use uh, a modus that is covering a big area. And once you spot something of relevance inside of this big area, uh, you switch the modi and, and take only you know very detailed pictures of this singular um, area. So here it's not so much about you know limiting the amount of data you're you're uh, sending down, but it's already during the acquisition that I, AI can can actually help to really focus on what you're interested in. Right. So of course this is something you can't do for all applications, right? But it's still quite relevant for forest fire detection, for example, or, or object detection, like chip detections, things like this. And then you can even go further and say, well, actually, AI can already help for remote sending before the sensing by helping to track the, the health status of the satellite. So the, the health status of the satellite is, you know, depending on a lot of different parameters that are all tracked, but they are highly correlating with each other. And those relationships between the different parameters, they are highly complex. And it's not so easy to say, let's assume there's a rise of temperature. Is this going to be a problem or is this to be expected because maybe the satellite is moving out of the shadow of the earth and now it's hit by the sun things like this so in this case it's kind of easy to say well in this case rising temperature is not a problem but there might be other issues where even falling temperature might be indicated problem and analyzing this is really hard for humans and even here ai can already help so even before the sensing during the sensing and then also doing uh, the, uh, the transmission of the data and then once we have the data that, that both Maria and Paolo were was already mentioning, once we have the data to, to structure our data archives, to make them searchable, uh, to visualize the data we have um, and find the interesting parts in it. Do you have any um, large projects uh, on uh, structuring the data? Uh, is... um, at the DLR at large in, in, in our institute, uh, yes. So there are uh, approaches, for example, trying to visualize data um, for humans using uh, virtual reality, so that you, you know, you wear your uh, HoloLens or, or any other kind of VR um, gimmick, and then try to, you know, display those those big data cubes in, in a way that it's really easy to interact in a natural way for for humans with that. Um, there are also approaches to to do kind of like an image retrieval on, on the databases. 
so that you you know you don't need to have a text-based search query or you just look for a geolocation, but you can show an example image and then screen the database for this kind of example image. Hmm. Yes. Uh, Polo used the word killer application for uh, AI in remote sensing. Um, let's let's think a bit. Uh, that sounded bad. I think that uh, that AI kill uh, all other methods. But um, but Maria, what do you think would be a killer uh, application in a positive sense in artificial intelligence uh, applied at remote sensing? Killer application. What would be kind of the uh, dream field of AI to apply AI uh, in, within your field remote sensing that kind of, that would, uh, I guess, uh, push the field forwards that would be useful for you? So uh, I particularly uh, am biased towards the process understanding <laughs> because I think we need to understand what's going on with the planet to just address the challenges. So for instance, I'm involved in uh, studying the droughts and floods, so climate streams and everything. And uh, I think it would be great if we could exploit all the data we have just to understand where the planet is going and uh, to be able to anticipate and provide the information to the different services. So that, that would be for me like to understand from the data, extract the maximum knowledge from the data and learn all the vitals yeah. from our planet. Yeah. Exactly. So, so uh, understanding is, is, in a sense, could be at least a hard concept. Uh, of course, physics equation, as you showed earlier today, is one way to, to understand. Uh, and especially it could be uh, easier to understand if systems are linear, if systems get nonlinear, it's already uh, could be a mess, even though you have a <laughs> physics equation underlying. Um, this is, so if you yeah. can elaborate, do you, what do you, do you think um, AI could contribute to uh, understanding or is it the opposite that all these methods, uh, you mentioned earlier, the black box problem of AI, uh, that's definitely a problem. Uh, so, so, so do you see any way to combine your understandings, uh, understanding and maybe also physics equation with, for example, deep learning uh, to propel the field, uh, but still have the understanding part? Uh, I think, for instance, uh, taking into account causality is fundamental. So it's we're not still there to understand how to extract the causal structure for data from data. But I, I think that would be great, because then we can actually study and design the net in a way that we can actually control it somehow to fit fit and get the good results but also understand what's going on so how to, how can we act on it causality hmm. yeah. uh Rone, do you have any comments to the killer application uh, <laughs> part of ai into remote sensing yeah, maybe one comment first to, to what Paolo says that uh, deep learning kills everything so to, to some extent this is really true and i, I really see this as, as a problem in general, in, in science, not just in geoscience and remote sensing, that we have like a monoculture and everybody's just not doing deep learning. Um, but interestingly, he also mentioned the data fusion contest. And in, in, in the context of the data fusion contest, it's usually not deep learning who is winning. It's very interesting to see. It's usually uh, ensemble methods. So the people try deep learning quite early. That's the first thing they try, but then they switch to something else, which is, uh, you know, a little bit better manageable in, in, in some aspects at least. And, and then the winning approaches are usually something ensemble of different mo models or maybe just a plain random force or something like this. So this is really, really interesting to see that, you know, on the, on, on the academic side, we, we are doing like 99% deep learning, but on the application side, it, it's actually looking different. Right? And then regarding killer applications, well, for, for me, the, the biggest potential among other things I see is actually in data fusion in, in the true sense of big data. So in the sense of big data that it not just means a lot of data, but actually a lot of data that is very heterogeneous. So one example might, for example, be that we have um, those big data archives where not just new data is coming in, but there's also old data, partially decades old, right? The very different properties, spectral properties, um, the, the pre-processing that was mentioned before, like atmospheric correction was different back then. Uh, the spatial resolution is different. 
Uh, but this is of really high value. I mean, this is a, a history of our planet for, for the last decades that we have recorded. And now we have this modern data and somehow we need to figure out how to you know, combine the modern data we have and we acquire now and in the next 10 years, how to combine that with the data we already have in our archives in order to look back into, into the past. And the second uh, aspect of data fusion, this is, which is really intriguing for me is uh, to fuse images, remote sensing images with uh, measurements from the ground. So either in situ measuring measurements, like uh, Maria had a couple of nice examples for soil moisture in her talk, but also measurements um, in a, maybe like in a social context, like uh, content of tweets or, or something like this. So like um, information from social media. Um, also other measurements like weather stations, for example, and uh, things are starting to happen there, but I think there's a lot of potential in, in those things as well in order to be a, a killer application, as you put it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, by the way, the data fusion contest, is that a yearly contest or is it a... Yep. It's yep. Uh, yearly. So since 2006, uh, it's it's done yearly. Um, uh, so every year we try to come up with, you know, exciting new data, uh, trying to push a little bit the, the boundary of, you know, the, the common benchmarks that are around anyways. Uh, so we are not just trying, you know, to do like the 100s land cover classification contest or something like this, but really come, come with new data. So this year, oh, well, this year organizing it, next year is then the actually the 15th anniversary. Uh, and I think it will be quite exciting. So we will announce what will be the task in early December. But not right now, we are still with our partners uh, curating the data and make sure everything is correct. And then early December, we will announce what is the new topic. And it, it will be, I think it will be really interesting. So I really like uh, the, the, the topics we have for, for Data Fusion Contest 2021. Sounds very inspiring. Yeah, could, could you please give one example uh, of, of a contest where, where deep learning did not win, as you uh, said earlier? <laughs> um, so for example, in the Data Fusion Contest 2020, we had the task that um, you, you get satellite data, it was Sentinel-1 and 2 data, uh, together with um, semantic labels on a very coarse resolution. So the, the resolution of the semantic labels was, I think, like, 500 times 500 meters or something like this. So it's a really coarse, right? Um, if you compare this to the Sentinel resolution, it, it's just like a, a couple of pixels in the reference map for one patch of, of, a, of the Sentinel data. And there the goal was then to, to use this, uh, you know, this, this reference data, which is partially wrong because it's a low resolution, maybe also misaligned, there might be a label noise in it, to use it in order to super resolve it. So to produce a semantic map on the resolution of the, of the image data. And uh, here, um, deep learning models had a little bit problem because you have so strong noise in your labels. Uh, I mean, they are like wrong most of the time because the difference in resolutions, right? Uh, and uh, if you apply deep neural networks in, in, in this most straightforward way, they are actually quite sensitive to this kind of label noise. Right? So there are workarounds, but in the context of a contest, you might not have the time to, to apply those workarounds to you know, try different architectures and so on. And then something where you can um, test different ideas much, much quicker, and which is by definition, of, or in its essential nature, more robust to label noise, this is actually helping. And one of the, the winning uh, approaches was actually using some, some modern form of Gaussian mixture models. A Gaussian mixture model with a lot of uh, components which shared parameters and were modeling patches. Uh, so this was quite exciting to see that, you know, a, a well-established technique like Gaussian mixture models with some modern flavor uh, added to it can actually beat deep neural networks. Exactly. Uh, by the way, do you have any examples where deep learning actually won the contest? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, <laughs> and I'm not saying there was none. Uh, I, I don't remember a singular approach where, where it really clearly outperformed everything else. Um, it's sometimes in the mix. So if, if people using a mixture of experts, then then usually like a deep neural network is in it. Uh, in 2019, we had a contest for semantics 3D reconstruction. There, deep neural networks uh, helped to, for the for the 3D reconstruction part. Um, let's really hope for 2021, I think, on that uh, question then. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> let's go uh, f further on. Um, yeah, the, e the UN Sustainable Development Goals are important, and um, satellite data is uh, 
and remote sensing in general is obviously uh, one field that could give us a lot of knowledge of uh, especially insight into into climate change and other things uh, where do you see that ai and remote sensing could uh, help into those and um, dig into those questions if you start with the uh, parallel maybe so uh, let me let me just uh, tell you that the fact is basically that if you look at the UN SDGs, you see that the most of them are actually somehow related to the Earth observation, but uh, you need a lot of other data, like for instance, economic data, social data, and other environmental data, not only environmental data that you could obtain from Earth observation. And this comes back to what Ronnie was mentioning, and I'm, 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 I'm willing to uh, stress it again. So uh, right now, if you want to use Earth observation in order to be useful for the UN SDG, what you could do and what many people are doing is basically to extract uh, an information layer or more information layer at the national level or at the global level that can be used uh, as an input uh, to a specific uh, model. Just to give you an example, there is the IPCC model about the climate, which is the, you know, there are many models, but of course the, the, the International Panel of Climate Change, they made a number of models. And of course, uh, you can use Earth observation in order to obtain some of the layers that are used uh, as a, uh, to obtain uh, the forecast about the temperature for the future. But in reality, uh, this is a way to use uh, Earth observation to extract one layer while for the UN SDGs, you might use Earth observation together with other layer in order to extract uh, the information of the uh, indicators that uh, that um, that someone want that UN defined as useful. So uh, again, in urban areas, when you talk about uh, and this is my area that that's why I know it. Uh, when you talk about uh, being able to um, understand if there are slums or shanty town, let's say all over the world. This is something that you can do partially by Earth observation, but it doesn't uh, count the problems related to the social social problems, economic problems, water shortage, uh, shortage of uh, medical um, assistance, which basically is something that defines at the UN level what is a um, uh, what is a slum. So uh, in order to obtain the final result, you need to uh, use together a number of inputs, uh, which are extremely heterogeneous. So we go into the big data with the D, the diversity, that specific D, not only the fact that we are just going into a huge amount of data. And there, I think that uh, AI is and will be more and more useful because there you can have uh, uh, a better uh, uh, let's say combination of the data. So again, data fusion, as Ronnie mentioned, is something which is where AI could be useful. When we talk about data fusion by different satellites, it's one thing, but also, and especially when we put together information by different, very different data sources. Let me just add that doing going in this direction, we are actually all, unfortunately, hitting the other problem of uh, uh, of AI, which is the black block, black block problem that was mentioned by Maria, and that we can uh, say is the explicable AI problem. So the fact that we don't know, I mean, we know that maybe we get a better result, but we don't know exactly why. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, it is somehow related to the fact that, uh, you know, AI is somehow trying to mimic the intelligence of a human being. And when we have a result by, a, we, we hear some, something by someone, we don't know exactly why this guy is saying exactly that. We don't know everything and we will never know everything. That, that's one point that we need to think about. I totally agree. The black box problem is, is a challenge. Uh, and it's also a challenge when it comes to, in general, very, very complicated systems. If you have 
It doesn't only, uh, it, it could even be a physics equation, as I mentioned earlier, on if things are complicated enough, enough terms, nonlinear interactions, and so on, uh, then understanding is hard. But Maria, do you have any uh, comments to the, uh, we were talking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, do you have any comments to remote sensing and AI in that respect? Yeah, uh, perhaps uh, I can add about the zero hunger SDG. So I think that we could really help agriculture production if we if we were able to to use all the information that we have from earth observation properly and try to to anticipate for early drought, for instance, and understand why the why the crops fail and when are they going to fail, so we can you know, anticipate in, in that direction. So all around agriculture, I think that is a, a powerful field. And uh, also for our nowadays industry, well, when we come back to reality for tourism, uh, I mean, to reality, to normal life after the pandemic, <laughs> I think we're all looking forward to travel again. So, <laughs> and uh, I personally think I, I like to choose traveling options which are more sustainable. And if we add earth observation data uh, to the um, tourism industry, so people is able to choose a destination also so in a kind of blue, blue way, right? So being, uh, being sustainable and helping, and I think that would be also good. So mixing information of environmental conditions to, to our everyday lives and decisions. I'm uh, thinking uh, of an app. For instance, on the mobile app, you just get all the info. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I was thinking also, I, I mean, these are challenges we're really facing in the world uh, when it comes to uh, sustainability uh, and climate change. And also, these are also reflected in, uh, in the European programs now, Green Deal and Horizon Europe, for example. Uh, could you elaborate on that, Maria? What do you think about the Green Deal? Do you see an opportunity for uh, increased uh, research and development within uh, within uh, remote sensing and AI field there? Well, the European Union has made this incredible Copernicus system. Mm -hmm. And now we can access the data through the DS platform and everything. So that, that's really boosting the use of Earth observation data in situ observations. And there are many uh, small companies like that are being developed um, uh, together with this, this Copernicus idea. Um, and uh, I mentioned in my talk about the, the Arctic. So there's a new, you know, uh, Europe and uh, I think America and all countries are very, um, are very interested in knowing what's going on with, uh, with there's no ice in the Arctic, I think seems to be, you know, so there's a lot of industry and a lot of routine possibilities and everything. So uh, there are satellites that are gonna be monitoring this, this region of the planet especially, and uh, we must uh, use the data for, yeah, to exploit, to exploit the data for good. <laughs> yeah, Hopefully. exactly. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, uh, Rone, with respect especially to the European programs, to Horizon Europe, uh, European Green Deal? programs? Yeah, I mean, definitely AI and remote sensing has, has, a, has an influence there. So there are a lot of H2020, uh, H2020 calls that are explicitly asking for the combination of remote sensing as a possible data source, as well as artificial intelligence as, as one of the possible tools, right? So they have it explicitly in, in their calls. Um, the last one I, I read and actually ended like I think two months ago, which was about um, wild forest fire detection. Right? So where they had this uh, explicitly inside of the call. Um, but there are many other applications um, like smart farming, for example, uh, biodiversity by wetland monitoring and, and, and things like this. And of course, this also aligns with the SDGs. Um, so um, you, you ask, well, what's the imp impact of, of AI and remote sensing on, on the SDGs? And actually there, there is a quite nice um, nature paper about exactly that. Uh, so for general AI, they estimated around 80% of the targets where uh, AI is an enabler. So not, not AI and remote sensing specifically, but, but for, for in general, for all the targets. While 
Interestingly, also for around 35%, I think they, they estimated the risk that it's a limitation actually, so that AI is actually hurting the, the targets. But when we look at the environment um, factor, it, it, actually it's better. So there is more than 90% where AI is helping mostly understanding climate change, but also um, tracking deforestation and so on. And when we, when we talk about uh, EO for SDGs, I mean, there is an, an initiative exactly called like this, right? The EO for SDG initiative, which just like a couple of days ago uh, announced uh, their, their, their winners for, for their awards. They, they had 14 different awards where um, especially how AI and remote sensing is combined to solve the SDGs were awarded. And uh, they had quite, uh, quite interesting um, winners there. It's, it's really worth to, to look through it. So the, the most interesting I found was not really connected to geoscience, uh, but to detecting slavery from space. So that I found really in, intriguing, you know, that you can detect hidden populations that are abused uh, where their human rights are not treated properly and that you, you can detect this to some extent from space. So this I found really interesting. Um, on the other hand, I think um, geoscience remote sensing is also a little limited with respect to the SDGs because mostly we focused on, so the SDGs were given to us and now we are focusing on how can we use remote sensing to, to you know, solve them. But actually geoscience is not so much involved in, in the definition of the SDGs. So this is still a little bit lacking. So this discussion is dominated by other sciences, mostly social science. Right? And you can see this in how the SDGs are, are formulated. Um, they are formulated on a national level, right? While the, the, the geo processes we are observing and, and investigating with remote sensing, they are not bound by, by nations, right? If you have a, a big river, uh, it's, it's not stopping at the border. Uh, but if you are developing SDGs on the river delta, where it's you know uh, going into the ocean, um, you can be your, your effort can be quite easily nullified by any kind of SDG development in another country that is you know doing something to the source, like building a dam or something like this. So those um, global nature of the geo processes we are actually investigating with remote sensing, they are not really well represented in, in SDGs. So I think there we need to be more active and actually take part. It's a discussion defining the SDGs already and not just how to help to, to solve the SDGs. Could the uh, GRSS be a source to being more active in that sense, uh, Paolo? Well, in reality, uh, the idea was what happened is basically that we were considering, we had a discussion last year at the IGERS conference, which is the main conference of GRSS. We invited uh, um, the geo secretary and he i mean geo is the global uh, earth observation uh, which is uh, an inter uh, uh, governmental uh, um, organization at the international level which is basically trying to harmonize uh, the work by all the government in the area of earth observation and this is done uh, at different levels i mean uh, by providing a sort of uh, meta, um, meta search uh, system that uh, allows everybody to look at the data which is nationally or uh, by the different uh, uh, providers collected. And, uh, but it's also trying to um, put together different uh, activities in order to use uh, Earth observation data that as Ronnie was mentioning is not exactly uh, let's say, um, limited by the boundary of a country uh, at the level of, uh, let's say, a region, which might be a group of countries or a, a continent, which in some cases is one country, in many cases, more countries. Uh, and therefore, we are just, uh, and therefore, the, the idea was to have some sort of collaboration between GEO and uh, uh, GRSS. Uh, so GRSS uh, uh, was planning for 2020. Then, unfortunately, we had other issues and it was impossible to do that, to uh, have some sort of grand challenge. So a challenge for our chapters. One of the characteristics of our society is that it is subdivided in chapters, which are a group of people that works together in a specific uh, geographical area that might be, and in general is uh, a nation or a country, let's say, but it might be a part of a country or bigger than a country, depending on, uh, mm, 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 on the situation. Then if you put this, uh, uh, so the idea was to have this grand challenge where uh, the data are provided to GEO. 
and uh, GRSS is providing funds to have the people in our chapter, the research in our chapter, work on a specific target related to their country or group of country and developing a methodology to extract for that country a specific uh, UNDG. So one of the UNDG. This is a challenge that we wanted to start in 2020. Unfortunately, it didn't work for you know, uh, the reasons that we all know, uh, but the idea is still there. And the idea is something that we will want to, we presumably want to start again where it will be possible. And we also now have a question from uh, um, participants, uh, Islam Alam Saad Mansour. How can the bias of derived, derived AI models be estimated uh, or avoided while we have lack of ground truth to avoid overfitting or underfitting, for example? Uh, Ronnie, could you maybe answer that one? Yeah, this is, uh, so if you ever can answer this question, uh, you, you will be, you know, <laughs> you can select a job in, in, the, in, in GSS or in, in geoscience in, in that sense. Um, so one way to avoid overfitting is to, to have more data. Um, this is a cheap choice, right? Uh, usually for us, the problem is not so much on the data side, but more on the reference data side, right? So we, we simply don't have a lot of labels available or soil moisture estimate, they're always coming from a small region and it's simply not possible to, to sample soil moisture by in situ measurements over the whole globe densely distributed. Right? Um, but one way uh, to, to deal with this is to, to recognize this. This is not something unique to um, geoscience and remote sensing. So actually computer vision has the same problem. They, they could have avoided that and postpone this problem a little bit. Um, because they have a lot of easy classes where they where they have a lot of labels around, right? But now you know they, they are getting in an area where this is not possible anymore, and they are more and more caring about problems where also they don't have enough labels anymore available. And the, the way they are solving that is, is um, called uh, self-supervised learning, where you basically use the data itself to train parts of your model, and then only the uh, a very small part of the model needs to be trained by the few labels you have available. So I don't really have the time here to go into details what self-supervised learning is, but the basic idea is that you uh, you hold out part of your data, maybe one of the channels, or uh, um, you change the resolution or the polymetric information of your source system, or you scramble the patches, something like this. So you hold out part of the data and ask your model to estimate that, to predict that. With this, you can you only need data, right? You don't need any kind of reference data. And data we usually have in abundance. So this is a little bit a way to to avoid. Uh, overfitting uh, by doing that, but still you can't really solve the problem. And, and the other question is then, well, if if we have this kind of model, we kind of need to find out where is it applicable, right? So is there an area on the earth where, you know, I train a model in Germany, is it still applicable in France? This is a very important question. Is it still applicable in over the tropical rainforest if I trained it over the boreal forest? Um, so there are ways to, to answer this question partially. Um, for example, you can look on, on probabilistic estimates. Some models give you an uncertainty estimate in the decision, not just the decision itself. So this is one way. And there are other approaches that try to directly classify whether a certain area is actually well represented by the training data you have. So then at least you know in, in this area, I can't trust my model. My model will give me an answer, but I can't trust it. So th there is work around, but this is really ongoing and, and very hot research and very important. Yeah, totally agree. The, and, and not only in this field, it's uh, in all fields uh, where you apply deep learning and um, AI methods. Uh, so this is a huge free research field. And fortunately, we are almost at the end of the discussion. Maybe you should just have a short round. If you could have kind of one wish come true for, for your field uh, in the coming years. What would that be? Uh, Maria, if you could open. Uh, to me, it would be that we can trust actually these black boxes and we trust them and then we know how to work with them. So I, not totally, I guess it's important, it's impossible, but at least some parts of it. So we can play around and, and use them with the physics nearby. Would be my wish. Yeah, my my wish would be that uh, you know the the possibility of uh, 
using uh, artificial intelligence would also foster the possibility, you know, the, the collaboration among uh, uh, different areas. This mm -hmm. is actually work now going on, and uh, you know, your uh, um, the Nora is basically one uh, example of that. We have another thing in Italy. I know there is in Germany. I don't know in Spain, but there are people working on AI, and this and the interdisciplinary work is helping in every aspect so my wish is that we have uh, more collaboration and we uh, work together in order to improve the knowledge of uh, i mean the possibility to share knowledge at different level so i really wish that uh, we increase uh, the amount of open data we have um, like the copernicus initiatives this is really great and it's a was a great boost for the community as a whole, but especially for deep learning. And I think if, if more um, satellites or data acquisition platforms are publishing the data under a public free license, this would really be of huge benefit for the whole community. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I think, just to summarize shortly then, I think uh, we have a few challenges as I mentioned here. For example, the black box challenge, and maybe that the field is a bit fractionalized. We need more collaboration across borders and organization. Uh, but still, if I um, understood you correctly, I think the, the future could be more more first we were talking about this uh, remote computing out at the edge at the satellites uh, but also not the least data fusion then uh, using different sources and more open data uh, and also the more interdisciplinarity so as i think to summarize with one word uh, as paul also said i think uh, col collaboration more collaboration collaboration would be be the single take or message from uh, from this discussion. I want to thank you all, uh, the whole panel, for a very interesting uh, debate, uh, and uh, thank you to Andrea and everyone organizing this. Thank you very much. Thank you, class. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.